Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back down to the dungeon. It's Chris, coming back to you again with Good Roads. And today, we're going to continue the snowboard building experiments that we've been working on all winter. We're also going to caffeinate. In the last video, we made this. This is a snowboard base sheet made out of recycled material. This one in particular is made out of laundry detergent bottles, but it's the plastic HDPE, which is one of a very common set of materials that are used for snowboard and ski bases. So the next thing that we need to do is to make a board to put this on. Earlier in the season, we made a very bare bones plywood powder surfer. And last year I made a fully composite powder surfer with a proper base and everything on it. It would be fine to just take the three sheets of ply that we've been doing kind of a standard and press a board out of this. But the thing is, the plywood that I'm using as sort of my veneers in these layups is eighth inch. And when you get out into the nose and tail of the board, if you've got three sheets, you've got three eighths of an inch worth of wood in the middle of your board. It's just weight that doesn't need to be there. Every professionally made snowboarder ski out there has a profiled core. What that means is it's thicker in the middle and as you get out towards the nose and tail, it thins out. And that does two things. Well, actually, I guess it does three things. It allows the nose and the tail to be more flexible, which is good because you know, you need a little bit of flex if you're landing or if you're hitting bumps or whatever. It makes it so that the middle of the board is strong enough to bear the weight of the person on it through the center of the bottom of the board. And it also shaves off weight in the nose and the tail, especially if you're doing rotation, which snowboarding and skiing are all your turns or rotations and then you get into the air, the spinning the flippy news. You want to reduce the amount of weight that's out at the ends of the boards. That seems intuitive. It's also physics. You're reducing the moment of inertia. So one of the things I want to experiment with in this board, this prototype, is to kind of get a sense of what our profile core is going to be like. Still going to do a plywood core, but I'm going to cut the sheets to, to a set of lengths and almost like build a pyramid. The thickest part is a shorter piece of wood and then it goes out and goes out. It's a pretty interesting idea. I think way like a decade ago, some snowboard manufacturer was experimenting with horizontally versus vertically laminated cores. And let me explain that really quickly for people who don't know. A horizontal lamination is plywood. It's like your skateboard where you've got a bunch of veneers stacked on top of each other. Vertical lamination, or V-lam, actually, I have a vertically laminated board. I'll be right back. Oh man, it's covered in dust. Let's get this thing weighed down. This is cool. So this is a vertically laminated board. A normal skateboard has all of the wood piled up in layers this way, a vertically laminated board has the wood going in strips vertically. And the glue seams are in between the uh, the different sheets of wood. So this isn't like a veneer inlay or a stain. This is, um, the nose is a little dirty. This is a very old board. This is one of the first boards I ever built. Let's see if I can find, yeah, here we go. You can kind of see it here. These are just blocks of wood that are glued up perpendicular to each other. Now. That is how snowboard cores are traditionally made. That is, the you know, vast majority of the boards on the market are that. And in fact, the, the reason I thought of it was, um, I forget which company it was, but K2 or Rossignol, one of them was experimenting with horizontally laminated cores about a decade ago. And the idea was that it would, it would give them a three-dimensionally profiled core, because most snowboard cores are, it's basically a two-dimensional shape. And this, whichever company it was, was um, kind of cutting shapes into their verniers. So as they stacked up, it formed more intricate shapes and did interesting things with weight distribution and stuff. I don't know if they're still doing it, but it was a really cool experiment. I love seeing uh, even the highest professional level companies getting out and doing things that are a little weird. So that was kind of the inspiration for this experiment of trying to get closer to a profiled core, but still using the stacks of plywood. Another little added benefit, uses less material. That's kind of cool. So I'm gonna cut those sheets. I'm gonna make sure that one is gonna cover the whole base of the board and then kind of get two others that are a size that I think would be a good distribution of weight, kind of going off of intuition. But that's the plan, so let's get to it. All right, there we go. I wanna to say too, 
that in addition to cutting the top layers of ply to different lengths, I went in and chamfered the edges. I took a belt sander and went in and gave the edges of all of the sheets a nice shallow angle. And what that's going to do is when we go to fiberglass this, and we are going to be doing a composite build for this one, the fiberglass is a cloth. And as you drape it over stuff, it behaves like a cloth. So if you've got a hard 90 degree angle, like you would if these were cut straight, if you imagine a cloth draping over that, it'll kind of do this. It won't get tight, tucked right neat into that corner. And there are a couple bad things about that. One is this is either going to become an air pocket, the part under the cloth, or it's going to fill up with resin and just waste resin, which resin is one of the most expensive components in a snowboard build. So we want to be really judicious about how we use it. The other is that 90 degree angle is going to become a weak point. If instead we chamfer that angle, which is what I've done, the cloth is able to follow a nice smooth drape, reduces those weak points, gives us a better chance of of using the right amount of resin. So I just thought there would be a lot of advantages to it. It also makes the side profile just look a little less janky. So that was something I wanted to try. The next thing that I have to do is I have to establish my center line. It isn't going to be a huge deal because this is all going to get cut to shape, but at least on this top sheet, which is actually a little bit thinner than the other two, I'm going to draw my center line. I'm going to use a jig that I made to drill holes for T-nut inserts because I am also going to try to put bindings on this board. And then we'll take it from there. So let's get to it. So I'm just using a carpenter's square for this. This is a neat little trick. It makes it really easy to draw a center line instead of having to measure and pull a ruler down. My piece is about 12 and a quarter wide. So that's going to be six and a half, or sorry, six and an eighth. I'm just going to set my gauge to six and an eighth. It's a rough measurement. So you don't want to just draw the line down from one side because it might not be perfectly centered. But what you can do is you take your pencil, you draw a line from one side, and then you butt your square up from the other side, draw a line from the other side. You can see there's about an eighth of an inch between the two and that was overlapping. So I'm going to come in about an eighth of an inch on my square. And that should give me a line right smack in the middle of my two initial ones. Perfect. And that is going to be right on center. So I'm going to just take the square, try your center line. Now, this isn't a center line like I would have if I were building a longboard from a tem template or something, because I've got my center line established on my template, I've got my center line established on the base that I made. So it's going to be really easy to find that center line. This is just here to make sure that the binding inserts are right smack dab in the middle of the board where we want. This is a quick jig that I made to try to make sure that all of my binding insert holes were lined up correctly. This would be for a four by four. I've got my little tick marks. I don't know if you can see that on either end. All I got to do is line those up with my center line and then drill the holes. These are going to be in line. I'm not going to be doing two sets of bolts. I plan to make a more robust version of this that makes it much easier to drill out an entire set of binding insert holes for a whole board. So look forward to that. But if anyone wants the SDL for this so that they can print one out for themselves, just leave a comment below and I'll put it up on my mini factory and uh, reply to you and stick a link in the, in the description. All right. So the plan here, the way this jig is gonna work is I'll hopefully just be able to drop the drill down. It'll keep my holes nice and square to the board. It'll make sure that they're spaced out appropriately. But what I'm hoping to have happen is by drilling through all three sheets at once, when I go to pop the T-nuts in, it'll kind of act as registration and lock everything into place so that the sheets aren't sliding all over the place. That's the hope. Um, either way, I'll just get these holes drilled and we'll move on to the next step. Making sure my center line is lined up. It's another of the same drill bit. I'm just gonna drop that down into the hole and that way this won't wiggle around. As far as the placement goes nose to tail with the bolt holes, I've got my template right here that I'm referencing. That template was based, it's actually this whole set of boards is based loosely on the K2 Cool Beam. It's a size that isn't really represented in their product line, 
But a lot of what I've heard when it comes to making snowboards is if you're really unsure, to base it off one that already exists. So we'll do that and then I will over time start to make it my own. This template, in addition to having the profile in the center line, it also has some marks to indicate a general sense of where the binding inserts went. So I'm just kind of eyeballing it. This is an experiment and a prototype, so if it's not quite right, that's great. I get to learn for my next one. So the tail one is probably somewhere around here. And by doing this four x four setup, I'll have lots of options as far as binding placement goes. Cool. The next thing we need to do is just a little bit of prep on the T-nuts that we're using as our binding inserts. These are just normal M6 T-nuts that you would get from your local big box home goods store. One thing that has to happen is the threads that are inside these T-nuts are the most important aspect of them. Those are the things that the bolts go down into to clamp our bindings in place. We're gonna put these into a layup in a set of molds with a bunch of liquid resin that's gonna cure really hard. So we need to make sure that these threads don't get filled up with resin. So professional level binding inserts will often have a plastic insert inside of them or plastic inserts that you can buy to fill them up. I'm just gonna load these up with clay and you can probably do the same thing with wax. And then after the layup's done, I'll just go in and kind of tediously fish that out with a toothpick or a nail or something. I've done it before, it works okay. It's a little labor intensive, but it's way better than having your threads filled up with resin. And then the other thing that we need to do is these teeth that are used to just make sure that the T-nuts don't rotate. We don't need them to be that aggressive. So I'm just gonna go in with a flush cutter and nip them down. I wanna make sure the back is covered up too, because it's open. Proper snowboard inserts, I think the back is actually closed off so you don't have to worry about it, but in this case we just want to give ourselves the best chance of success, so we're going to close up as much as possible. I mentioned earlier that uh, wax would probably work very well too, like a soft wax. You know what I think of every time I think about this is the covers for like Baybells. I feel like they would work really well. The advantages to wax is that it would be easier to get out. You could heat it, you could scrape it, and then it would additionally act as a lubricant on the threads, which would be kind of nice. But I don't have any, first of all. And second of all, it's a little harder to get in than clay because it's a little bit harder of a material. So I'm just rolling with what I got. It might not be the ideal material, but it's gonna do the job. But it might be worth experimenting with wax in the future at some point too. That's our threads all sealed up. Should keep them nice and protected during the layup. I'm just gonna go in and nip off all of the tangs. Ow, that hurts your hands. Ow. <laughs> Stainless, dude, it's a bastard. These are M6 T-nuts, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that, but that's a standard thread size for bindings in the industry. Cool, that's them all done. Last year I went through all this trouble to grind down this post a little bit so that it was the exact height of the deck I was making. I don't think it's worth it. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna put them in the layup and then if the nuts are a little bit proud of the surface, I have to grind into them anyway. So I'll just file them down and then grind down to get to the threads. Should work just fine. So this is the bottom side of my bottom layer. I've flipped it over. I'm just gonna go in and Drill a little recess so that the brim of the top half shape of the T-nuts has a place to rest down in the hole. A farsner bit would be a much better tool for this than a spade bit, but I ain't got no farsner bit, so this is what we're gonna do instead. And again, I'm just kind of eyeballing this because I'm not being super precise about the bindings for this board, and this is also all gonna get filled up with resin, so I'm not super worried about it. Just a little bit of an extra detail. Should be fine. Ah, ah, like a, like a glove, like a beautiful, like a charm, like a beautiful, it's beautiful, it fits like a glove, it worked like a charm, it's like a beautiful, charming glove. Whoa. 
what's up for rock and roll? So that's all the parts that we need to make to make this board. I've just got to cut some glass, and then we're going to start preparing for the layout. And, I mean, this isn't my first rodeo. I've done a fair amount of composite work, but it makes me nervous every time. I'm probably going to do a quick dry run to help build the confidence level up. It's always a good thing to do, to run through your layout beforehand, because it is time sensitive. Just like anything else, it helps to practice. So I'm going to cut some glass, figure out my layout, get a little practice in, and then I'll walk you through what I'm going to do. And then since I have to be wearing a respirator, I'll do it. Using a 12 ounce 45-45 bi-directional glass, because that's what I have on hand. If you want a really good rundown of composite materials and their uses in boards, I made a video a little while back about adding fiberglass or any other composite material to the bottom of a skateboard. Do a really thorough rundown of all the different types of materials and what all the terminology means. But to recap really quickly, bidirectional means I've got fibers going in two directions. There's tri-dimensional and unidimensional fabrics as well. So I've got a bidirectional fabric and the 45-45 means my fibers are going 45 degrees this way and 45 degrees that way. Uh, 12 ounces is the weight of the glass. It's um, 10 and 12 ounces I think is pretty standard for snowboards. In my experience with compositing, it's a heavier cloth. Uh, skateboard stuff I tend towards like a six or eight ounce. But this is what I got and it's gonna do the job. So let's pull the trigger on this. Carpenter's square again. It just stops you from having to do math. It's really nice. But I'm gonna get my board with. A little over 13 inches. And I can come over here. And I'm just gonna give myself a set of tick marks and draw a line and cut to that. And then I need to do a second one as well because we're gonna do top and bottom. Word. So, to recap, before we get into the layout, the things that we're experimenting with with this board are we're experimenting the effectiveness of the recycled HDPE base layer. We're experimenting with doing a staggered length Baltic birch core. We're experimenting with doing some binding inserts on this powder surfer so we can get a better feel for how the shape works relative to how it would behave as an actual snowboard with mindings instead of a power surfer type snowboard. We're upgrading from our last build from straight plywood to composite. Should give us some information about how that works. And in addition to that, combining the composite with the staggered core, we'll get an idea of how our profile shape might start to look, might start working. So the first thing that needs to happen is we're gonna mix up some epoxy. I'm using a five to one boat building epoxy. So once we've got that good and thoroughly mixed, wearing our proper safety gear, which is a respirator and gloves, once that's mixed up, we're gonna lay down our base sheet. We're going to wet that out. Little pro tip, I've been watching a lot of videos on how the professional shops make their boards, and in every video I've seen, they're using leftover pieces of base material as a squeegee, so free squeegees. Next, we're gonna put down our first layer of glass. We're gonna wet that out. After that, we're going to put a little bit of resin on the binding inserts and pop them into the first sheet. Drop that into place, wet it out. Drop the next layer of plywood on top of it, wet it out. Drop on the third layer, make sure that there's an even covering of resin over those three. Drop the last sheet of fiberglass on and wet it out using the colored resin. Put a piece of plastic over the top. Use a combination of heavy stuff and clamps to get the mold down as tight as possible. And that's all she wrote. Oh, whew. Okay, 
I think that's clamped down about as tight as I'm going to be able to get it. Now we wait, wait and hope. See you tomorrow. You. Uh, I don't know, dude. I don't know. Okay, so I flipped over the deck. I'm just gonna pull off the sacrificial sheet and the tape that was on the base of the board. You can see I held the, the kind of mosaic of the different pieces of plastic together with masking tape. I only did that because I was expecting to pull that tape off before this went into the layup. If you're going to tape a base sheet together and then put it straight into the layup, you'd want to use a packing tape because that's plastic and the resin won't adhere to it. So this is going to be a pain in the butt to get off of the board. But that's okay, if there's little pieces left over, I'll go back in with a scraper and a sander and make sure that everything's removed and then it's nice and smooth. Oh no! D-Lamp. Right away. I didn't even make it out of the blank. Dude, that sucks. Stop that. Stop that nonsense. I don't want to see that. Shoot! That sucks. And there was definitely, definitely enough resin in there. Damn. More demon. Come on, dude. That sucks. That's a real shame. This base sheet looks cool. Oh, that was so much work. Ah. Well, there it is. Totally bummed. I had this whole 8-bit gradient thing going on. But as soon as, soon as I started pulling the tape up, These guys, especially down here, the white stuff, doesn't seem to have adhered very well. Lordy. What a bummer. That was an awful lot of effort to get such a weird result. I'm looking at these pieces that I pulled up and there's resin bonded to them. It's like the resin didn't stick to the glass. So I've been thinking as this project's progressed, I've been pretty concerned about this layout and I'm not really surprised that it failed. The last kind of straw in that for me was that when I went to go press this yesterday, the places where the individual layers step down, this is actually a pretty cool thing. This, this works out to our advantage. But the foam of the mold, I was hoping that it would deform. And as it hit those ridges, it would squash down. And I don't know if my clamping pressure was too low or what, but it did. Now, that sucks for this project because it means it didn't get pressed well, but it's a really good thing to know about the insulation foam as a prototyping material for a mold because it's way more robust than I thought it was. I think if I were to press something like this with a two-piece mold again, I'd want a really thin layer of a much softer foam that could conform to all the curves. I've seen that in a couple home board build examples, and I think that might be a good route to go with here. I'm thinking that we learned something. First of all, we learned something really important, which is Whatever it was that we were doing to try to bond the HEPE to the resin was not an effective ooh, was not an effective treatment. So you absolutely need to do further experimenting with techniques as far as that goes. Sanding, flame treating. The other thing that's kind of an advantage is while this was fun, this was a fun material to work with because it had so many bright colors. It was really irregular. The thickness was irregular, and it's thinner. Then, I know you guys can't see this, but the, uh, the plastic that came from the bottles is probably only two-thirds the thickness of the store-bought Humpy Ultra High Molecular Weight Polyethylene. So I'm going to be looking for a source for this material that is thicker, just so that it's more in line with kind of the industry standard, and I've got a couple ideas for that. The core flexes, so maybe this isn't a complete loss. I'm not quite ready to give up on this as a prototype. The last board and this board were prototypes. I've kind of been 
you know, hinting at it, of Winks as good as a not do a blind horse. The goal for, if not this season, because it's getting pretty late in the season, but the goal for this set of experiments is to eventually build a real board with all the bells and whistles. Base sheet, top sheet, profiled core, urethane sidewalls, proper binding inserts and a proper binding insert pattern, edges, the whole nine. And every step along the way that I've been taking has been in service of learning how to do that better. And this is, if we can get a proper base on it, it's ugly as sin. I think I can strip the core off of this, sand it down just to give it some texture to adhere to, put a new base sheet on it, and hopefully still get some use out of this prototype. As much as it's not fun to have a project kind of go south on you, there's a wealth of information that we can take away from this to find out what the things we need to find out so that we can improve upon our mistakes, build something better going forward. Those experiments that we have to do to figure out this whole bonding thing, a little bit of an unexpected turn for how my plan for the season is going to go, but we'll get it done and we will take what we learn from those experiments and go on and build ourselves a proper snowboard. So as always, I'm happy to have you guys with me, happy to have you with me for the successes, happy to have you with me for the failures. I'm learning a lot as I go, I hope that you're learning along with me and yep. Yeah. Ah, let's figure out where this takes us. Till then, Thanks again for stopping by, and I'll see you soon. No, I'm hitting it this time. <laughs> ah, c'est la vie.